ladies and gentlemen, rabbis and professors. I think that I covered all the genders here. Uh, well, as you know, after hearing, seeing the, the pictures of the Rebbe and hearing him, which is, uh, it has mostly, the, the great power of it is, is the truth shining through it. I mean, the, the young man, Rabbi Zarchi, couldn't abstain from telling some, some things that are not completely true. Just me, speaking about me, about me. So you, you should ignore it. I mean, he possibly doesn't know what he's talking about. So, uh, so let's go to the more or less, to, more to the subject. Now, please, uh, I don't know where he's hiding, but uh, let me just, it's, it's not really beginning of a speech. I'm not as great, a great speaker as, as you'll find out in two minutes' time. <laughs> but uh, look, he, he employed at least twice, perhaps more, the notion of you will enjoy this evening. You will enjoy hearing so and so. Now, for me, it is almost a, they are fighting words. What do you mean you will enjoy? I mean, if you wanted to enjoy, you go to a discotheque. If you want to enjoy, go to, go to a restaurant. If you want to enjoy, they are, I don't want to make all kinds of suggestions, some of them indecent, but I mean, there are lots of places that you can go and enjoy. I mean, is this the idea that you are going to enjoy? I mean, the, the whole notion is, is not just a foreign notion, it is an appropriate notion. What, what you are supposed to, be, to, to have here, if, if I will do anything, is, I won't say to suffer, but at least, uh, at least to have, not the enjoyment, but I would say, if not the urge, at least the itch, of coming of of of, of free, when when this this evening is finished, of having something which is not satisfied, not complete, not enjoyable, which means that a person has to to afterwards, if if any anything happened, is that afterwards he feels unfulfilled, not enjoying, and he feels I have to go and do something. That would be a great thing, and not an unenjoyable evening, an evening that will be, that will be, I would say, stressing you, bothering you, making you, uh, I mean, at least, if not a little bit nervous, and so on. Now, I'm not going, I'm not going to be, to be offensive. I mean, uh, I, uh, my, it's not my second name, it's my first name, means gentle. So I have to be only sweetness and light. Uh, if I can, well, I'll try. Uh, my wife uh, told me before I left, is she said, should, you should be positive. You should be positive. And see, I'm trying. I mean, just uh, <laughs> scarcely afraid of, of any reports coming to her that I wasn't I wasn't completely positive and not completely full of light. No, okay. So this is just as a, as a, as a, also an introduction about what I'm going, not what I'm going to say, but how I'm going to say these things. Let me begin with something which has slightly to do, even with the, with the name of the subject. The name of the subject. I don't know, possibly some of you still remember Alice in Wonderland. I mean, there is there, one of the great philosophical discussions there is that of the white knight in Alice in the, in the Looking Glass about the thing, the name of the thing, the, the name it, it is called, the name, what is, what is, is, is the name that it is called identical to the name it is, and what is the connection? All these things are, are interconnected about when you, you give, you make a caption. And then, let me begin from that. And I'll begin, uh, it just, it's, it's just a good, a good source to begin with. 
is in the Talmud, which is an interesting book, uh, not an easy one by any means. There is a there is a something that goes a long, a short, a short, uh, a few sentences that say that in the times, which is say if I'm taking about times, it's more than two thousand years ago. There was among the many disputes of the two major ideological or halachic houses of the time, it was called Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, one was a dispute, a very unusual dispute, which was, is it worth for a person, for man, man, mankind, to be born or not to be born? That's, the, that's how it's asked. Is it worth to be born or not? And they had this, the story that was in the Talmud, they had this dispute for two and a half years, disputing it. And then they, dis they made the decision, an unusual decision, that in this case, the halakha, the law, the result is according to Beit Shammai, which is basically, it's not worthwhile to be born. Now, Beit Hillel, who were positive, possibly more positive people, and less, less tending to, for just criticism, just said it. We will have to rephrase it, and we'll see. It is indeed not worth for the person to be born. But once he is born, he should at least do the best he can. So this is, a, this is a piece of the Talmud. And now I'm trying not to, not to write a commentary, but to, to say, to, to explain a little bit about this, this, this kind of a text. The question whether it was worthwhile to be born or not worthwhile to be born is a question that is basically more profound, meaning much more profound than that question, the famous question of to be or not to be. Because the question about to be or not to be is a personal question and is a personal situation. Here we ask a, a, the problem that they asked there, that they, they were discussing, was a question that has nothing to do with my personal existence or my personal life, happy or unhappy, uh, or whatever it is. But it was a question that went in so many ways not to our to our, what I call, pra practical existence, but to the, to the justification of this existence. And it was, in, in a way, a very, a much deeper question. And it was, we are here, that's obvious, we are here on this world. We are, we are here, we are living here, uh, and, and we are not nobody, including Beit Shammai, had any intention of telling people, go and annihilate yourself. That that's wasn't the point. But the point was, is if I'm taking the role of, of man in general, in a very big picture, is this role of man something that is worthwhile, intrinsically worthwhile? Now the dispute is, is, is a dispute about, not just about the role of humanity, it's, if you may call it in a certain way, it's, it goes to a question, and I'm not going, I'm, I'm trying always to be, to be slightly uh, distant, to distance myself from theology, but, but the, the real question is, is there any sense in our existence? Or is this, does our existence justify itself? Now, this is a question that has, as I say, it goes beyond private life or private experiences of people. It speaks about humanity, the whole bulk of humanity. Is it, has it a right to exist? Now, to have a dispute like this, as they have a dispute about uh, whether you should make uh, the blessing, this blessing before the other blessing. So you have in the, in among other disputes about uh, how you wash your hands this way or that way, they have also a dispute. What is the position, position of our existence in this world? It seems, it seems funny, but again, I, I, I'm not going now to discuss that thing, but rather the point of, of having the discussion 
having it all the discussion like this, in which there are two houses, they are debating, they are what they call debating a, a question like this. Now, the debate means because they are houses, not private people. It is not a matter of a sentiment of people being what they call more, more, more uh, I would say, uh, more inclined to joy or less inclined to joy. It seems to be it's a discussion of taking the world as a, in the, as a whole. Now, uh, just uh, in, to say it in, in a very short way, in so many ways, the, the two houses of Shammai and Hillel, the, the houses uh, really differed if one wants to make a, a very general summary of the difference. I would say that Beit Shammai were idealists, Beit Hillel were realists, and uh, many of the disputes can be understood in this way. Uh, Beit Shammai were thinking about whatever they were thinking was about a perfect picture, perfection, a, an ideal existence. Beit Hillel were thinking about existence as it is. Now, it is not as simple, and it should. It is far more elaborate. It's not my, the subject of my discussion, but I'm saying they have the same discussion about what was what was first created, heaven or earth. Beit Shammai say that heaven was created first. Beit Hillel say that earth was created first. See, you have the same the same range of ideas. Beit Shammai are people of the of the of the heaven. They t when they see any picture in this world, they don't see it as it is, within the limits, but they want to see it in a, in a broader sense, in a broader way. But they are far more confining themselves to problems and questions in situ, as they are, in time, in place, and so on. Now, that makes lots of differences about approaches from small questions to big theoretical questions. and. It is a dispute in a strange way. We say that in our times, which means in Olam Hazeh, in this world, the law is according to Beit Hillel. But in the, in the world to come, after Mashiach coming, the law will reverse itself. The halacha will be like Beit, Hil, Beit Shammai. And the reason is we are living in, in, in an imperfect world. The form we have to go with Beit Hillel. In a more perfect world, we can then follow the ideal, the perfection, the notion of the things, how, how they are. So the question there about the role of man, the existence of man, the justification for existence, is, is the for a question about what Beit Shammai say, and in, in a certain way this is, is agreed. In a certain way, man's man, as man, as, as what, whatever, as a creature, as a creation, is perhaps not justifying the effort put in it. It's not justifying it. Because in, in real life, in real existence, it's not because people are sinning. Let's say there are small things. But because people be, re really don't care. People don't mind about these things. Now, Betty Lake tried to maintain, not just the status quo, but try to maintain a positive outlook, saying, here we are, here we strive, here we struggle, here we try to do things. And Betty and I say, in a, in a, again, compared, not with, with, with the animals, but we have to compare ourselves, and that's one of the points, when I'm comparing him, myself with a monkey, I have I can see some advantages. Some, you see. But if I compare myself with an angel, I see lots of imperfection. See, it in, in many ways also the, the ways what kind of a picture do I I have before me? What kind of a of a of a, of a view of of the world of existence do I have before me? And in, as such, there is there is a big, a big difference in, in saying that one, one may say, what is man? 
what is man? What is, what is, I'm quoting, say, the Psalms. Ma adam What is it? What is man? And Betile tried to maintain. There is some good in us. There's possibly more good in us. Now the result, the agreement about it, is an agreement that, in a certain way, it says there is an imperfection. If we had to make a choice, we shouldn't make a different choice, whether to be or not to be. And we would say, possibly better not to be. Now, Betile, very practical, say, OK, not to, to be or not to be is really not a, a problem that we have to make any choice about. We have to make a choice how to be. And there, it has nothing to do. In fact, what Betty says, please disregard the big picture or the, or the big theoretical picture. Let's see. Here you are in existence. And what, what do you have to do about things that, that you have to do? Now, all this is just a, you may say it's a, it's a discussion about notions, ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak, want to speak now. And first to begin to speak about the Rebbe. Now, everybody that had the honor of seeing him, of meeting him in any way, he saw he was, he was a great man. Now, uh, you see, words are usually used in such a cheap way that they, they don't really mean anything. But uh, let, me, let me try to say what means greatness. Most people, most people don't, don't really, what they have is they have all kinds of wonderful attributes. But when you take from them these attributes that sometimes are intrinsic, but still they are attributes, they are not the very definition of themselves. And then you find out that they themselves are not very important. I remember I used to do, among other things, which, which the, 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 when they introduced, they didn't tell all, all the, the great deeds that I did. One was I was once in the, in the, in the, in the, in the directing board of a zoo. So uh, I, had, I had lots of opportunities of watching animals, uh, four-legged ones, two-legged ones, lots of animals. And one of, the, of the, my experiences was to see something, a plucked peacock. Now, peacocks are some of the most beautiful birds. I mean, when you see a peacock in its glory, it's really a glorious sight. But when you see the plucked peacock, the black peacock sees, looks like a, a thin and rather ugly hen, and that's all. So when, when I'm speaking about greatness, you have the fellow, the great writer. Take from him his writings, and what you have is again the same black hen, not, nothing more. And you have the, the scientist, the great mathematician, or the great statesman. Take some, some of these things off him. So these people are small people with some greatness attached to them in one way or another. So there are so very few people who are great. Great. Which means that the greatness is not a matter of a, of a special quality. You see, people tried. Hasidim, Chluchim, uh, just fools, try to speak the Rebbe. The Rebbe was, was a great scholar. I mean, that, that was immaterial. The Rebbe had a, the Rebbe, had, no, not, not because it wasn't true. He was indeed one of the greatest scholars of, the, of, of, of his era. But that's not the point. He was great, even without being a scholar. He was great. He was, he, he, he was a great leader, but he would be great even without being a leader, wherever he was. So greatness is, is the quality of death of greatness. You see, the Everest is a big mountain, so it doesn't really matter if it has, it has more snow or less snow on its top. It's big. So the Rebbe was a great man, a great man. And 
I, it is something that I have been writing about, dealing with. Uh, it is a very, very apt description of somebody that says, said to me, I mean, he said, I met lots of great men, including uh, saintly people, great, I mean, people that were rebels, uh, I mean, leaders of, of, of groups. And he said, all of them had, he says, I knew them, and I became close to them. All of them had something that one would call, they had the qualities of saintliness, of scholarship, of some of them had, as the Rebbe had, the notion, uh, some, some, the ability of clairvoyance and of foreseeing the future, the ability to bless and so on. But still, all of these people, he says, the saintly people, and he didn't disparage them, all of them had a piece of themselves that was a purely human piece, which means you could take this person and there was some kind of a private corner in which the person was just an ordinary human being. He was a great saint indeed, but there was some time, a quarter of an hour per day or something less in which he was it was it just a person, a person that smiles at a, it's a joke or enjoys any, any other thing. He says, the Rebbe was the only man that I saw that was for 24 hours every day, all the days he was a Rebbe. Which means there was nothing, there was nothing else. There was whatever he did, and it didn't have to be impressive or not impressive. Everything that he did was, I say, it was not just greatness, it was being a rebbe. And from, from this point, I'm just jumping into, into something, something that is pertinent to the subject. He was the rebbe, and he was, he was a rebbe that was for generations, there were not such people with this kind of a, of a completeness of being a rebbe. Now, if I would, and again, I, I have for that not just uh, my uh, notions, but some, some documents that the rebbe himself wrote. It is, I mean, there are some of his letters that he wrote when, they, when, when really the Hasidim pushed him to this position. And he's writing letters that are unusual for him, very, very touching, very emotional about how can I take this suffering? I don't want it. I don't desire it. I'm not fit for it. I'm not anything in, in doing it. It's not me. See, now this is the man that was for 50 odd years it wasn't just that he was the leader of a movement. I mean, this, it wasn't the leader of a movement. He was, he became the rebbe of, as I say, completely, without any reservation, which was, he did it, and here I'm coming to this, exactly what I began. If he would be asked, that not the same question of uh, to be or not to be, or is it worthwhile or not worthwhile, is it, is it, is it worthwhile to be a Rebbe? He would say like a Beit Shammai, no. Just a very emphatic no. And he said like Beit Hillel, now that I am a Rebbe, I'll have to, I have to do it in as completely, as wholeheartedly, as any, possibly more than a human being can do. So that was, that was just, the beginning of, of something which I would call it being a Rebbe, not, not as a position of honor, power, or even holiness. Being a Rebbe is basically as a heavy duty, a duty, an obligation, an obligation that you have to take usually you have to take it with a smile, but it is still an obligation because, and that's, let me just say, one of, of those things, and you could hear some of these things in, in those snip, snippets of, 
of his of his st statements or, 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 or discussions, short, very short uh, uh, discussions with people. See, the main the main point, the main I would say the main thrust <coughs> of of what he what he was doing was. An enormous drive, enormous drive, and you can see it in every every one of the sentences. And I heard many more of them. I heard them personally. Just, uh, I mean, one shouldn't 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 speak about oneself, but what can I do? That's at least a subject that I know a little bit about. Uh, more than, than 10 years, about 12 years ago, a little bit more, I wrote a letter to the Rebbe. Not as, it wasn't the first time, but uh, there, were, uh, there were many times that I wrote the same kind of letter, never received an answer, incidentally. Not for this question. He answered lots of other questions, but not this question, which I repeated for many years, asking him. And I came, I, it was a long letter that I wrote, uh, and I, I said, I tried to describe what I'm doing, describe I'm doing one thing, which is enough to occupy a person whole time, a whole day. But I'm doing also something else, which also is enough to occupy a person for a whole day. And the third thing, which is again something that takes, and it is a huge burden. And I find it is very hard to carry all these obligations. So I should possibly do what's called triage, cut something off. I mean, if I cannot do all these things, and I mean, I find that the burden is becoming every day harder and harsher and more difficult because the work comes. And it's never, it's never finished. So how, what should I cut? That was my letter, which is in the same vein I wrote for many years. Now this time, it was practically the last letter that I received from the Rebbe, the last. And the letter was something, the answer was not, not a very long answer. It says, please, or not please, uh, Continue all these things that you are doing, but do more of them, and add more things to those that are doing. So I tried once to explain about his demanding things like this, how it was, how it was, how can you do it? You know the famous, the famous story, which has became proverbial, about the, the, the fellow that comes, the, comes to the rabbi, uh, complaining about how, s how his, his, his room, he has a small house, and is full of children, and so on. And what, he, he cannot live there, it's un unlivable. So the, the rabbi tells him to take the goat into the house. So, well, the rabbi said, and he's ob obedient, he takes the goat. Now, goats are, as some of you know, uh, noisy, uh, frivolous, and smelly. So he had the goat at his house, and so he stayed, and then he comes to the, to the rabbi after, after a, a, a couple of weeks, and he complains bitterly. I mean, he didn't solve any question, any problem that I had. It was just another, and more, far, far harder. So the rabbi said, you know, take the goat out. So the man take, took the goat out, and he comes to the rabbi and said, well, what, what a big house I have now. How wonderful it is. Now, that is what usually, it's a, it's a, very, a very old story. The rabbi did do what the rabbi did was slightly different. He told, when people complain that they have hard work, he would take them, take in the goat. And now, after some time, they complained that it's terrible. He said, you know, take also in the cow. And when they complained, he said, if, you, if as it is, take in a couple of camels as well. And that was the, that was the way, always. I mean, 
when every, any, any time anybody complained about the burden, the hard work, the inability to cope with the things, the Rebbe would just give him a suggestion in the way that he used to do his suggestions, take something more. And that was doing always the same thing. Now the point is that you may say that it, is goes, it goes against the laws of nature. Because the point is, you have a certain amount, a certain capacity, a certain space. How can you, can you put into a confined space more and more and more things? Always. It was, it was clearly what the Rebbe did. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that the Rebbe did it for, in himself and for himself, but this was his general ruling, how to do these things. Now, what, what did it do? I mean, how can, what can, what will happen if you overburden people like this? Now, I, I can give you an answer, which is possibly from the field, from the realm of physics. I was once, when I was in, an honest, nice young man, I was a little bit in that field. And there is something which is, we know it in physics. When you put a certain amount of pressure on anything, including metal, whatever it is, there is a, me a, a, a measure that you cannot put anymore. But if you put 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times the same pressure, something happens. The very nature <coughs> of matter changes. What I call the molecules collapse. And then you have a different makeup of matter. That is, if anybody knows about astronomy, that is what I call the material that is in what's called the, little, the, the, the white dwarves in the, in, in, the, in the heaven. It is, they are small stars. That each of them, they are, they are as small as the Earth, something smaller. The mass that they contain is many times more of than or that of the sun. Because each, each cubic centimeter of the, one of these stars has a weight of about one ton. Why? Because matter collapsed. Matter collapsed and it became an entirely different structure. In a way, what the Rebbe wanted to do, and in fact, I don't know if he, if, he, if he put enough pressure on anybody like this, but what he wanted he was, it wasn't just to keep the material going, but to keep, to change the very nature of, of human matter, to change the very nature of human behavior, to change the very, the very rules in which, in which nature operates. Because, see, he was, he had a vast knowledge of science, and in a way, he was doing on, on on his Hasidim, and as you heard it, not only his Hasidim, of, with everybody that he encountered, he, he did the same thing. He tried to change the, the nature of the people. He tried to change the nature of the people to do something which will be completely different, completely different. They are not, they are, in a way, they are not people anymore. They are something, something else. Now, all this, if I'm, I'm going back to the, to the very first question that I, that I posed from the Talmud. Look, these things are a different way of answering the dispute of Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. The dispute was, is man worthy of existing? Is man worthy of, of, of being here in, in, this, in this universe? And as I say, all oh, the scholars, the Jewish scholars, the positive ones, the negative ones, the critical, and, the, and those that were full of lightness, they at last had to assume that man is not worthwhile, that humanity is not fulfilling its duty, if it has, that humanity is it's not what it should be. It's possibly, uh, if one would call it, it's a failed experiment. Now, what the Rebbe tried to do it was, it was, in, in so many ways, it was a, a, a see, a, there, are, there are such problems from time to time. 
sometimes you have only, p you know only that the equation can be answered by yes or no. What the Rebbe did was he tried to find the third kind of an answer, another kind of an answer. He said, is, the, the question was, is man worthy to exist in this world? Or isn't he worthy to exist? That was, and you can answer yes or no. And he said, let us recreate man. Let us make a new kind of existence of, of, of mankind. Let's make another kind of man in for which the answer will be positive. So it, it, it goes back to the very old question. But it is an answer that is not just about do good deeds. It is, it is far more than going, doing good deeds. It is a matter of how far, how far, how long, how deep can you do things in, so to say, changing, changing human nature. And that is, in, in, in a way, it's, it is not remotely, but very closely connected to, to the Rebbe's emphasis, which was all his years and became stronger and stronger as, as the years went on. The Rebbe spoke about the Mashiach again and again and again. The Rebbe spoke about it. The Rebbe spoke about it, incidentally, in order to make it, I mean, uh, uh, to make it clear, even, uh, so to say, as, as a matter of, 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 of historical facts, he, he made it clear enough, even in his first public speech, that that is, that is the matter he's interested in. And he, the same, the same notion, he repeated thousands of times, practically in every public speech of his, there was always the same, the same notion of Mashiach is coming. Now, Mashiach is not a, a small little thing that happens from time to time. That is, that, that is, that's not worth it. Mashiach is, in, 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 in a real way, in a real way, Mashiach means something, if I speak in, in, in real words, Mashiach means really and truly the end of history. That is Mashiach. Mashiach means that there is, there will be a time in which it won't be only our attempts failed or successful in trying to become slightly better slightly nicer, to do things, to solve problems one way or another. But, the, but because all the things that we are trying in the, in the generations, in the ages, have a, a, a nasty quality. They are reversible. We are doing things, we advance, we progress in a certain way, and then we have a backlash, and then we have a failure, and then we have a point of of losing, of losing everything. So this is, this is what history is made of. History is made of, it is a story of the, I would say, the attempts and failures of, of humanity. Mashiach means that there is, it will upon a time come, that the, the, the problem will be really solved. Solved in a way that there will be a change in the world that will be irreversible change. That from that time on, there is, not, there is no way of failing. There is just a matter of how fast you advance, but there is no, no, no longer a matter of failing it. You come to the point in which that is the end, almost what in the biblical term, the end of days. The end of days, the end, not of time, the end of of the, I would call the, this, this kind of a, of a, the, the ups and downs of, of, of human, of human history in creating something that is irreversible. So, these traits, as I say, the personal traits, and <coughs> the other ones, were basically, all of them were, you could see that it was 
it was there, there were converging lines, converging lines that came from very different directions, from very different ways, and they were, you, try, you put so much work on a person until the person becomes something else. You become, you do, you do it, and that is why the shluchim, and not just the, the shluchim, the rebbe would, uh, the, when the rebbe proclaimed once, and he, he tried to do it, he wanted to do, a, to make a, if, if, every house, to make it a Beit Chabad. Because he wanted, he didn't want to, be, to make it, he was not interested in creating professionals, truly not professional Jews. He, w he attempted to do something which is our hope, our, our vision of the world, to change not only the a few people that are obedient and are nice, but to change the very nature of all the Jews, to change them and in, in the same way. You demand more, you ask more, you are never satisfied because, because I, it's being bad natured, but because the real, you still didn't go to a, into a different phase of existence. And that different phase of existence is that what I call, that is what happens, as I, as I call it, the collapse of matter as it is, the collapse of the, collapse of the existing structure and rebuilding of a very different structure, a very different structure, more compact, less empty space, far more contents, far more substance, that is the change. When this change, is, is not just a matter of, of a few people here or there, or even those few people that cannot do it. When this comes as, a, as something that, that has to be done with everybody, when, when the Rebbe was, was in his last years crying about, it, about bringing the Mashiach, push, shove, push, again and again. Now, bringing the Mashiach, is much harder than creating a state of Israel or creating an America, because a state is a state. It can be gained or it can be lost. Bringing the Mashiach is changing the, ex the history, changing the world in a way that it will never revert back, in which the world then goes in a very different direction. All this erratic graph, of existence, with the ups and downs, with, with every, that every, every, ascent, every ascent is followed by a, by, by a fall, every, every effort is followed by a failure, and so on. How, how can we change these things entirely? And so, there was the attempt, the, 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 the great, I would say it was, it was a cry and a, and a question and a quest, and asking people, he, in a way, he asked people not to do what they can, but in many ways, he asked people to do what they cannot do. See, that is what's called in Hasidic thought, Bechol Meodecha, which is, uh, yes, it, it's, by the way, it's a part of the Hasidic explanation of Kriyat Shema. And you should love God with all your heart which means all of it, the good desire and the bad desire, b'chol nafshecha, with your own soul, which means you give him your life, and b'chol mu'odecha, and then after you gave, you, you gave him your heart and every desire that you have, you gave him your life and everything that you possess, and then give him more, that is b'chol mu'odecha, and then give him more. Now, what is the more? The more is those things that I cannot do. See? Because there are lots of things that I can do. Lots of things that I can do. But what, are they, uh, he, what he was speaking was about the things, that, the things that you cannot do. When you come to a point in which you say, this is something unthinkable, impossible, something that I cannot, I can never do in my lifetime. And I am somehow going and doing it. That is, this is what the Rebbe wanted. Because he said, Mashiach comes only when we 
we, we pass the, the world of the possibilities and we come to the world that is impossible. When we do not only what we can do, but we do those things that we can never do. When we, we, when we are not working 24 hours per, per, per day, but we are somehow working more than that. How can it be done? It is impossible. So that is, the, in, in so many ways, what the Rebbe did, and when I spoke about his personal life, I said, who was the first person that he made this experiment upon? It wasn't any one of the Hasidim. It was just he himself. He, when he writes about how he cannot, he cannot, he's not able to, he's not willing to. He says in his words about, he, he, he says, they tear my, the flesh from my bones by asking me to become a rabbi. But then it comes something which is beyond the will. It is the duty. It is the duty, and the duty is, it is not be changed and agree to, 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 to sit on a, on a, on a chair. The, the, the duty is be changed, be transformed. No, in a way, no, no longer a, a human being, but something that, is, that goes beyond being a human being. And that is, that is what, he, what, he really taught, what he said to everybody. And he said, in a certain way, sometimes with a smile, and sometimes with a, with a cool, almost half, half of a joke. And he once told me something. He said, I never make a joke, never. Which means he, some, he lots of times smiled, but he never made a joke, which means everything that he said was deadly serious. And those things that when, when he's telling people, some of whom were ignorant and uninterested, uh, people that had no, no relations and no desire to do anything, when he told them, I mean, to do all kinds of things, it was because he was, he was very serious. He was very serious about what they have to do, what they should want, and, what, and how much they should want it. And the, 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 main, the main notion was, if there is a, is, if there is, it is more than, than what I call a message or a mission or any particular thing. It was the Rebbe wanted really, really and truly to do something which is far more, far more reaching than any revolution. See, in his, in his Rebbe's lifetime, I was possibly uh, not, uh, not clever enough, and I, I said then, it was uh, some years ago, I said, what the Rebbe wanted wasn't just to put on, to put on another pair of tefillin, or to have another woman lighting candles of, uh, candle, candles of Shabbat. Not that he didn't appreciate it, it appreciated. He appreciated in the, the smallest move, the smallest desire, the smallest kind of, of even of a tendency to move, he appreciated very much. But it wasn't what he was working for. He was not working for making a big, a bigger, uh, a bigger movement or a more powerful movement, or to do to have to have a, a thousand more shluchim or, or or ten thousand more books. It wasn't. It wasn't that. What what he wanted to do was at the time he said it. He wanted to do a complete revolution in the whole world. He wanted to change the whole world. That was the Rebbe wanted. But what I'm saying to you now is more, is far, far more reaching. He didn't want to just to make a revolution. He wanted to make this kind of an irreversible change in human, in human nature. To make, to make a, a, a irreversible, irreversible change in human history. To change everything, to become entirely, entirely different. Now, I, as, as not being a speaker and kind of an honorator, 
I, I don't want to, to finish with any kind of a, of, a, of a loud proclamation or anything like this. It's not proper. It's not proper. It's also not true. And it's not right. You see, when I'm saying these things, I'm saying in a certain way, as the Rebbe said, he understood people very well. He knew about them a lot. And among other things, because many of them revealed themselves, almost they became more than naked in his presence. I mean, they became, they, they, they told everything that they had to tell. And so he knew the failings and knew the weaknesses. And he knew lots of it, lots of it. Not only by what we call, by a kind of the, the, the Holy Spirit that makes, made so many people trans, transparent to his, to his view, but just the very fact of, of knowing them, what they were. And now with all this, I'm going here, say, it's Boston, Boston Jews. Okay, now Boston Jews are, are possibly nice people. Surely, surely these that come here, they should, they, they take the time, the effort, and, and they sit quietly and they listen to, to one, one speech, another speech, a longer speech. So it's nice people. Now, what I'm, what I'm, but, but what I'm, I was talking about wasn't just about nicety and about nice people and what nice, it's just if you may say, it, okay, you have here, uh, some good mediocre doctors, good mediocre fathers, good mediocre mothers, good mediocre professors, and do good mediocre rabbis. That's, that's more or less, and this is more or less what you can expect from Boston. And now, to speak about, to speak, to be there, to be here, and to speak about those things that I said, which are basically, they are outrageous. They are outrageous. Because I didn't speak about what simple, little, mediocre people are supposed to do. I spoke about things that are far beyond the limit of the strongest, of the fastest, of the most exalted. But I think that that was in, in the, the other part of the message of the, of the Rebbe. And was, the message was, if you cannot run, if you cannot run, you have to run. And you have to run twice as fast, 10 times as fast to reach to anywhere. But if you cannot run, walk. If you cannot walk, go on all fours. If you cannot go on all fours, crawl. But go, but advance, advance, advance. So, so in many ways, it wasn't not taking care of, of humanity, but it was, in one hand, it is in a certain way. It is, that's what I'm also expressing in a very different way. Not the way of the Rebbe, uh, not the eyes of the Rebbe, not the smile of the Rebbe, but I can express it. See, in all of this is embedded something, a huge amount of belief and a belief that is something that all these things are somehow possible. That whatever you are and how you define, not only define yourself, but also how you're defined by others, objectively and more objectively, critically and even more critically, but all that, that is, it is beyond this is, is a belief. There is a belief that all these things somehow can be done. All these things can somehow be achieved. It is, it is, not, it is not just blood, sweat, and, and tears. It's much more. It's tearing one's, one's person apart. It is making, it is, it is being transformed into an entirely different, different existence. But this is talking also to the people knowing the limitations, and knowing the, all the limitations, as I say, in a way I'm saying, okay, here we are, all of us, 
small, limited people working in a way, and will we'll go to sleep in the, us the usual, not the usual hour. But what, what can be done? And that is, the, that is really the main point. We can begin to move forward. We can, we can begin to do it from every different different step that we that every different place that we stand we can do we can do something something about it. Let me put it in, in one simple simple way. We possibly cannot achieve everything, but we can do something which is within our capacity it, which is let each of us, Wherever we stand, wherever we are, in whatever direction we are, take just at least one step forward. <laughs>